Hi everyone, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. I'm so excited to be sharing with y'all this week uh, some of my lesson plans from the week, um, some things that you might get to use in the coming weeks for your lessons in your elementary music classroom. Um, a couple quick things, um, you can find um, a lot of my resources on my blog, which is makemomentsmatter.org. You can find old episodes of my podcast um, when you search through uh, Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast. There's a whole um, archive of those things that I've used in years past. I've been doing it for a couple years, so you can find some old gems in there if you're interested in more lessons and ideas. Um, but what I'm going to be doing this week is I'm, in a second I'm just going to do a rundown basically of all my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons for the week. And then I'm going to do a deep dive into third grade, um, which is a little bit more folk dancing this week uh, because my third graders are getting ready for their upcoming um, family folk dance night. So I'll be sharing a little bit more about that in just a second. A couple quick things. Um, it, along the way, if you hear me say like, that's on the links page or I put a link to that. Um, a lot of times I'll talk about books or resources or things that um, a lot of people are like, ooh, where can I find that or what is that? Um, on my blog, makemomentsmatter.org, if you click on the videos tab, there's a drop down link and you should be able to find um, the links page. There's a links page just for all my Musical Mondays videos. And for each episode, there's a quick recap with links to things that I talk about. In Instagram, it should be in my LinkedIn profile. On Facebook, it should be at the bottom of the caption that for this video, a direct link to that. So you're not searching around. But it, you can find it on my blog, makemomentsmatter.org. One more quick thing. Um, this Saturday, I'm going to be in Norfolk, Virginia with the Tidewater Area ORF chapter at Old Dominion University. We would love to have you there um, Saturday morning. If you're in the area, it'd be so nice to have uh, more people come out. We're going to be singing, saying, dancing, playing, creating. It's going to be so much fun. Um, I think it's nine to one. Um, and so check out uh, the Tidewater Area ORF chapter. If you follow me on Facebook, I, there's an event for it. You can click through there and find some more details. But if you're in the area, it'd be so nice to meet more folks and to you know talk about music education and, and, and spend time together. ORF chapters are amazing because you get to take the time to talk to other people who understand what you do and problem solve and try new things. And um, it's so much fun. So I'm, I'm so excited to be there this Saturday. Okay, well, I'm going to run through all my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons for this week, um, tell you what I'm teaching, show you some of the things that I'm using, um, and then I'll do a quick deep dive into third grade at the end of that rundown so you can see a little bit more in depth of what I'm doing in third grade. Um, so kindergarten, uh, they come in every week. This is the seventh time I see them. So every week they come in. The first two or three times it was getting them acclimated to like following a line, doing the train song in, and I tell them when they come in, this is the last day to do the train song. Oh. Next time when you come in, I'm gonna meet you at the door and I'm gonna be holding my ukulele and I'm gonna be singing our circle song, the one we've also been singing every week since the beginning of school started. And your job is to come right on in and make a circle. You're so good at it now, I think you can do it without the train. But we're gonna do the train song one more time. It's gonna be so much fun. So we do our train song one more time. But then next week, I will meet them at the door and they'll be ready. The kindergarten, first and second grade, every class that comes in, they come into the song, they come in, they make a circle and they sit themselves down. And that's just our procedure. So um, the, the kiddos are used to that. And um, this is just the ki the first and second grade are used to that. And this is just my chance with kindergarten um, to, to say next time it's coming. Um, we come in, we do our circle. Um, I do instead of just um, the copycat, I do uh, the copycat game that I've shared with you before. And then for kindergarten this time, I say, hello, Madison. They say, hello, Mr. Rao. Hello, Jeremy. Hello, Mr. Rao. Hello, Jose. Hello, Mr. Rao. Um, hello, Etana. Hello, Mr. Rao. And they, they get to say back and forth. Um, with my older grades, I'm using sort of silly voices. So like, hello, Jose. And they get to go, hello, Mr. Rao, because they love that because they're echoing my silly voice. They get to use a fun voice. Um, but you know, we're also exploring our voices. We do that. We're seeing what other sounds we can create. With kindergarten, I'm mostly just sticking with the four voices. So I'll do one was like, hello, Etana. Hello, Mr. Rao. Hello, Madison. Hello, Mr. Rao. And they get to, you know, either singing, speaking, shouting, or um, whisper. And that's always fun because it's a good review of the voices, but it's also a chance for them to try and they don't know. Maybe one of them is going to get shouting voice. Like very few of them get shouting voice, but it's fun for them to try that. Um, uh, then I pull out... Um, uh, uh, we just do a quick copycat. We run through. We do a few echo back and forth of clapping. We do padding. We do a vocal exploration. 
Um, and then we get to go back and do our Five Little Pumpkins poem that we learned in the last lesson. So basically we go back over to that little gate that I had last week, that little um, yard work fencing, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It's, it's basically just a little tiny fence that's just decorative that goes on like a flower bed. And I have a couple of those and I put pumpkins on them. And that's how we learned the song, is, or the poem, is we learned what each little pumpkin said at that little gate. Well, this time um, we, we run through it once or twice and then I say, hmm, I have an idea. And I pull out these long ropes and I say, these are gonna be my gates and I, pull out the foam pumpkins and I say, I need five little pumpkins and I hand the little foam pumpkins to five different kids and they get to go sit on the gate and then each one of them, when I come over and, you know, the first one said, oh my, it's getting late. And I hold down the microphone for the kid to say, the sound is a solo. Uh, and I'm actually using my classroom microphone. So the kid who says, oh my, it's getting late. I'll hold down the microphone for them and they get to say it in the microphone and everyone hears their voice through the classroom speakers. And it's a magical day because every kid gets to go and I'll go along from kid to kid, you know, for each pumpkin in the story and each one gets to say their, you know, their line. So the first one said, oh my, it's getting late. The second one said, there are witches in the air. And, and sometimes there are kids who are a little bit hesitant and so I've learned a couple things. I've learned first, and this is a critical thinking thing, but the first thing I've learned is you need to give them a little time. Some kids, they just need a little bit of processing. They need the chance to think it through and to, to figure out, oh, the second ones. Some, some kids, they're sitting there quietly and it's they're not not participating. They're trying to remember what comes next or they just need the time to get it out. And so I always give them a little bit of wait time and then if they look like they're struggling or if they look like they're having a hard time remembering or if they're an English language learner and I know that, sometimes I'll prompt them with, um, the first one said, and I might say like, oh my, like quietly so they can hear me. And then they might go, oh my, it's getting late. And sometimes kids need that, but I, I don't try and, you know, like, if they don't say it right away, I wait for them. I, I give them a chance to think about it and what it might be. Because it's daunting because they're saying it in front of their peers and they're saying it to the microphone. It's daunting, but at the same time, for each kid to hear their own voice in the microphone, for other kids to hear their voice in the microphone, it's a super powerful experience. Um, and the best part is, when we get to the part that goes, went the wind and out went the lights and five little pumpkins rolled out of sight. The kid who, you know, the kids who are on the line who are holding the little pumpkin, hold their pumpkin close to them and then get to roll on the floor, which is so fun to see. Um, and they get to roll down um, across the room down to the next gate. And it's so much fun and the kids love it. And um, I go through all the kids, every kid gets a chance to say their thing into the microphone. Um, if we have any extra time left over, and usually we don't because it takes a little while to get through everyone, to give everyone a chance. Um, if we have any time at the end, we'll just go over um, Itsy Bitsy Spider, or we'll do Steady Beat, or we'll do all sorts of things. Um, at the bottom of my lesson plan, I always have like notes, extensions, exit question. And some of these are, um, I'll put on here, you know, like maybe what I'm going to do in the next lesson, what I'm planning to do so that I know that that's, I need to lead into that this week. Sometimes I put a little thing case like, Ooh, we, we went right through it really fast. <laughs> we went way through faster through my lessons than I planned. I'll have an extension there. So in case like, Ooh, I need, you know, I can grab this book or I can do whatever just so that I know right away what we would do next. But, um, if we have time, we do itsy bitsy spider or we do steady beat or we do, um, and I have another option down here. But most of the time, this will take the rest of the lesson. And it's just so much fun and, and totally worth it. First grade, um, they come in, they do the circle song. That's what I was prepping kindergarten to do. They come in, they do the circle song, they seat themselves. This time in the mix with the copycat, um, along with echo clapping and echo padding and a vocal exploration, I bring back solfege, just quick uh, call, um, call and they echo um, and I just use the syllables that they know um, and we just I use hand signs I show them where they are on the board I remind them of the procedure of that and I, I remind where they are in the room if they want to look for that anchor visual where they can find that and we just sing a few little patterns 
super simple, not complicated, but it's just sort of refreshing, like, oh yeah, Solfege is a thing and we are good at it. And so let's do a couple. Um, and so that's a quick, just little intro. Um, in the last lesson, we learned the pumpkin on the vine. And I'm gonna see if this visual will work. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> we'll see if this will work. All right, let's try. Hopefully some of you can sort of see this. All right, so I have these little foam pumpkins. I think I shared briefly about this last week, but I've got these little foam pumpkins and they're tied together with a green string. Um, and these I just got at the dollar store years and years and years ago. So I put them on my whiteboard and this whiteboard is so small, but they, I have magnets on the back. I put them on here and then what I get to do is I hang other little pumpkins that are blank onto the string and there are three little pumpkins and what I can do is as we're doing the pumpkin on the vine the pumpkin on the vine I picked the one that weighed a ton that's the one that's mine that's the song I'm doing and so um, what I have on the back here are um, letters for form and there's just it's a quick ABA song but what we do is you know I say oh I've got another part to the song and if it sounds like the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine. You know, I ident identify the first one as A. If this new one sounds like the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine, I picked the one that weighed a ton, that's the one that's mine, we'd have to call the new part A. But if it sounds different, we'd have to call it B, probably. And so I say, here's the new one. Okay, I'm gonna sing, and you get to decide if it's another A, like this one, or if it's something different, if it's B. And I sing, the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine. I picked the one that made a ton. That's the one that's mine. Oh my gosh. And they, they just say like, it's A. Usually they try and interrupt me and be like, it's A. You're right. It's another A. Wow. Great job. Okay, guess what? I've got another part to the song. Ooh, if it sounds the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine, what will we call it? Like A. And if it's different, what will we call it? B or something else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the new part sounds like this. Pumpkin, pumpkin, pumpkin on the vine. Pumpkin, pumpkin, that's the one that's mine. Can we call this one A? And they're like, no. You're right, we'll have to call it B. And I know it's backwards because I'm using my FaceTime camera, sorry. But I, it's a B and, and actually, when this is on the, the whiteboard like this, I can just leave them hanging like this and they can hang on the whiteboard on the little string. Um, they don't quite fit in this room, <laughs> but um, we can do that. And then what's cool is once we identify it, then I move it around to um, this form to ABA and we sing through the song in an ABA form with the new B section. And then we're, what we'll do in the next lesson is I'm going to let a kid come up and move the pumpkins around. So maybe the kid chooses ba B A A, or maybe the kid chooses A A B, or maybe they just choose just A A, maybe they choose A B, but the kids are going to get to choose and whatever the selected kid who chooses, chooses, whatever that one kid chooses, that's what we'll sing. Whatever form they come up with, that's what we sing. And so um, I have several different pumpkins like this um, with the the things hooked on so they're just ready to go in and out. If you like this idea or even this specific song, I have a whole blog post with the notation um, and with everything on my blog. I linked it on the links page, um, but it, it's there if you want it. These foam things just came from Target like six years ago and um, I just reused them over and over and over and over and over. So don't throw, even if they rip a little bit, they'll still work. Um, a couple of people on Instagram are asking me to sing the B section again. I'll, it is linked um, on the links page and the notations there, but I'll sing it one more time. It's just a little silly thing that I made up using So Me because years ago when I need, decided I needed a B section, I was working on So Me. But it it's completely made up. The first part, the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine, that's been around for a long time. The B section is just, I mean, you could use anything. I just made up. Pumpkin, pumpkin, pumpkin on the vine. Pumpkin, pumpkin, that's the one that's mine. You could do anything you wanted if you're like, that's derivative, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> cool, come up with your own. But the B section is just absolutely made up, so you could do whatever you wanted.
But that's how we play around with the form and we identify them using the pumpkins like this and then the kids love that they can move, in the next lesson, the kids love that they can move them around and they get to decide what form we have. And so when they do that, they feel like, oh wow, what ownership we have. And also they completely understand the concept of A sounds like the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine. B sounds like pumpkin, pumpkin, pumpkin on the vine. You could even say like, I have another pumpkin. <gasps> If it sounds like the pumpkin on the vine, the pumpkin on the vine, it'd be what? It'd be A. If it sounds like pumpkin, pumpkin, pumpkin on the vine, what would we call it? B. If it sounds different, what should we call it? And you, you could have a C pumpkin if you want. You don't even have to use it, but just say like, if it's different, you could, you know, you could say that. Um, but kids really, really like, they like playing around with the form. And, and when I first um, started teaching and I was told like, oh, we need to talk about ABA form in first grade. I was like, I don't know how to do that. But with an activity like this, you can play around with form and kids understand how the different pieces move around and how, and, and then later you can give them examples to identify ABA and they're a little bit more able to do that knowing that like this big section is one thing, this big section is another thing. And so that's, it's sort of a fun activity to take you into that. Um, then I do this book called uh, The Little Old Lady Who Wasn't Af or Who's Not Afraid of Anything. And it's a super fun book. Um, a lot of different people have used it in a lot of different ways. Um, I had an observer on Friday who was like, oh, wow, we use that, but we do it in a different way. Um, and so there, I mean, there are a lot of different things that you can do. But the it's a f very fun book, and I'll just read just the first part if you aren't familiar. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a little old lady who was not afraid of anything. One windy afternoon, the little old lady left her cottage and went for a walk in the forest to collect herbs and spices, nuts and seeds. She walked so long and so far that it started to get dark. There was only a sliver of moon shining through the night. The little old lady started to walk home. Suddenly, she stopped. Right in the middle of the path were two big shoes. And the shoes went clomp, clomp. And, and then I, like, I usually break into the story and I say, did the shoes speak those words? What, where did that come from? And kids will be like, you know, the, some kids will say, that's the sound of the shoes, like, stomping the ground. And other kids will go, I don't know where the sound comes from. So it's, it's fun to take just a second on this first one to identify, like, clomp is the sound that we hear of the shoe hitting the ground. And you might say, like, well, they'll get that. Not all of them. And so it's worthwhile to do that because then later on when you say like, meow is not really the sound a cat makes, but we, you know, it's a word we use. So it's, it's, it's worth, I think, taking the time to say like, clump. Are the shoes really saying that? Or that's the sound they're making. Oh, we're using the word clump. Is it? Yeah, the sound they're making. So anyway, sorry. The, so the shoes went clump, clump. Get out of my way, you two big shoes. I'm not afraid of you, said the little old lady. And on down the path she walked. Behind her, he, she could hear two shoes go clump, clump. So in the next one, I modify the text a little bit. I'll tell you what it actually says. The, the, the story says, a little farther on, the little old lady stumbled into a pair of pants, and the pants went wiggle, wiggle. Get out of my way, you pair of pants. I'm not afraid of you said the little old lady. And she walked on, but behind her she could hear two shoes go clomp, clomp. One pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. And so what um, what I changed this, it, the, the book says, and the pants went, or so she stumbled into a pair of pants and the pants went wiggle, wiggle. I add in there, a little farther on, the little old lady stumbled into a pair of pants hanging in the air all on their own. I how is that possible? And the pants went wiggle, wiggle. Because if it's, she stumbled onto a pair of pants, like, I always see kids' faces and they always have a very confused expression, like, what are these pants doing in the air? And sometimes I'll even stop and be like, Do they, are they on a clothesline? No, I, I don't see one in the picture. They're hanging in the air on their own? That's strange indeed. And so then... It's just a little, again, a little bit of an extra, but it helps give a little bit more context to the story if you if you want to do that. The other thing is I, I know what's coming. <laughs> so I know the text that's supposed to happen. So the text on the page says, get out of the way, you pair of pants. I'm not afraid of you, said the little old lady. And she walked on. Behind her, she could hear. And on the next page, 
two shoes go clump, clump, one pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. But if you if you say that after turning the page, they're already like, a shirt, like they see it. So I I say that before I turn the page because like I know the routine, okay? So I know it's the two shoes go clump and then the pants. And then on the next page, and suddenly she saw in the middle, that's when I turn the page, just when the narrative gets there. I, I know what's what's coming. So what, what we do in this class, um, we could read through the book. You could do um, what my observer said on Friday. She's like, we do body percussion for um, the different parts, you know, and then next week we'll do something else. You, what's fun is because we took the time to say like, the shoes don't actually go clomp, clomp. That's a sound they make. And the pants, you know, wiggle, wiggle. It's sort of a, an odd sound, but they, they are wiggling. They're not saying wiggle. They're, they're actually wiggling. And so what we do in the next le or in later on in the lesson is that we choose non pitch percussion instruments to represent each part of the story. Um, and so what we try and do is choose, if we have time, I let students choose. If not, I, I have a preset idea of what we could use. But um, try and find instruments that make sort of a clomping sound. Um, with my kids, I use hand drums, the lower ones. Um, for wiggle, wiggle, we try and do something that sounds like it's wiggling. So um, the pre-chosen one that I sometimes come up with is uh, jingle bells, sleigh bells, because they are sort of wiggling around. The little ball inside is wiggling around. Shake, shake is some sort of shaker. Um, it, when you get down to the end, you have, uh, let's see if I can pull it all up. Uh, you've got uh, two gloves going clap clap, a hat going nod nod, a big scary pumpkin head going boo boo. So the two gloves I do, anything that sort of claps, you could use, um, you know, a wood block, you could use a cowbell, it depends on how adventurous you're feeling. Um, the hat that goes nod nod is also a really tricky one to find an instrument that matches it. So what, what I do with my kids is they have a tambourine because they can put it on like a hat and take it off if they want it. It's, we use a tambourine as a crown later on in the year for um, Old King Glory on the Mountain, so it's sort of a fun precursor to that. And then the pumpkin that goes boo boo, we choose really big drums or I have these things called buffalo drums which make a sort of a fun low rumbly sound. So if you've never read the book, what happens is the all these things follow her home and she runs home like she's really scared and then they say, you know, we've come to scare you and she says, well you can't scare me. And they're like, but what will if we can't scare you, what will happen to us? Like, that's what we're for. We're here to scare. So she lets them be um, the scarecrow in her garden. So it, it's it's fun, and it's fun because uh, my all my classes, my kindergarten especially, they talk about scarecrows. There's a scarecrow like competition in downtown Woodstock that they make scarecrows for. So this is a, a great connection. It's a fun way to give kids a chance of playing the instruments or making connections between the sounds instrument makes, uh, instruments make and the sounds in the book. Um, there are a lot of cool things you can do with this book. And that takes the rest of the time for, for most of my kids. To read the book, to put in the instruments, to then perform it as a class, that takes basically the full length of our time. Um, second grade is, it's sort of um, what we did last week plus. So last week they came in, we did the copycat, um, we do the, just like the other grades, we do clapping, patting, we do solfege, um, we do all those things really quickly. Um, we do a thing where I pass out tone blocks and I've shared about how I do that before and that's just a quick back and forth with my um, students. Um, where I do it, they do it, I do it, they do it. We explore a little bit on the tone block, but I've done a whole video about tone block, so I'll, I'll direct you to that if you're interested more in that tone block procedure. Um, in the last lesson, we learned down the river. Um, the river is up, the channel is deep, the wind is steady and strong. Oh, won't we have a jolly good time as we go sailing along? And in last week's video, I shared more about that. So what we do in this lesson is like, this is our beginning activity of like, you know it, let's do it. You're so good at it, let's try it. Um, and so they learned it basically in the last lesson. We're just refreshing it and doing it again in this lesson. Um, and then kids uh, sit down. If we have time, we go to the note neighborhood and we, there for every concept in the note neighborhood, like um, quarter rest or half note or half rest or every like new thing, um, there's a, an introduction PowerPoint and then there's a practice PowerPoint. So we've already done the introduction like learning who is the quarter rest, what do you do for quarter rest. So there's another PowerPoint in there 
um, that shows the the quarter rest pract when we practice it, it gives them a chance to like go through and try it again and the one thing that's sort of fun and unique about this is that they do two lines and then they um, when Ta and Toddy and you know the quarter note and eighth note when they jump up to the higher branch of the tree that they're standing on they flip upside down and kids sometimes get confused about why is one up and why is one down we don't go into up and down where does that happen you know at this point but I just want them to see the quarter note upside down and see the eighth notes upside down and experience that and know that it could happen and we're not going to do that for a while but guess what Ta if you see Ta upside down it's still Ta you can still read it you just don't need to you don't need to worry why he's upside down he just he's a little higher so you know but it's a chance for them to try that out so if we have time in the lesson I know that we have the time um, then we go to the PowerPoint of the note neighborhood and we get to practice ta rest um, before our next activity it really depends on how well did down the river go how well did they come into the classroom did it did somebody ask a long rambly question I mean uh, again, one, that's one of the things I think about. The longer you teach, the better you are at knowing like, okay, that took a long time. This next thing needs to be sort of shored up or we can go through that really quickly or what, you know, but like I think when I first started teaching, I was like, I've got to do everything in order and i got to do it all the way through full length. But now I've realized like, I need to do what's important and so like if like I get to this I'm like eh, you know the the note neighborhood we can do that another day or not or I can do it on a sub day or whatever um, it, it's nice to be able to do that so that to, to give kids um, to, to follow the kids so like if our class took us somewhere else we can sort of okay I'm gonna shorten this up and lengthen this next section but I know that what's most important in this lesson is what happens next so if I have to skip a little bit and take out the note neighborhood that's okay so <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I showed how um, I took little cutout stars and I gave kids a bag full of stars and, and popsicle sticks. And we would sort of dictate um, long sounds and short sounds. This is before we were naming quarter notes and eighth notes, but e each one got a little star and then a bag of <clears throat> just popsicle sticks. And so if it was a long sound, they'd put a long stick. If it was a short sound, they'd put a short stick. And so that was fun. That was good. The kids got really good at that. We did multiple examples where they would listen to, you know, they'd hear me say long or short sounds. They'd hear me play on a recorder. Um, they we would listen to like triangles, you know, play a pattern or something. And they, they would be able to identify long and short sounds. Well, several weeks later, here we are again. <clears throat> Only now I have different shapes. I have um, leaves. You could still do it with stars or whatever you have. Um, but it's the fall. Oh, wow. And I have these leaves anyway. So let me put these up here. So <clears throat> what the kids do in this lesson is, um, you know, we talk about how I'm going to say ta or ta di, and you get to create with sticks. And so what kids will do for a ta They'll do a, a stick straight up and down. For Toddy, they can take, <clears throat> you know, sticks and put them like this. So two sticks next to each other with the cross beam on top, and they can make that. And sometimes I'll say, you know, if I wanted to, if, if I didn't have the time since I'm a teacher, if I, did, if I didn't have time to put out the sticks, I could use my stick notation, which is basically the same thing as just a regular ta, only here, if I make ta and ta di, there they are. And it, that's ta and ta di, but um, I just didn't have time to, to draw on their little note heads. Because, the, you know, the, that's the other fun thing about the note neighborhood is like the character's head is the note head. And so you can say, I didn't have time to draw on the, their head, note head, <laughs> they, get, they get that. So, um, and it's fun, the terminology sort of works and you can think like, oh, it's a character. But so I can draw this and then they can recreate with sticks. But um, what we do is in the first couple examples, I will say, you know, ta, 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 di, ta. And they get to take their sticks and they get to recreate that on the board with sticks. And in their little bag, they've got their sticks and their, their leaves and they're in, you know, the rows of four. And then I'll say, great, I'm going to come around and check. Let me just look and see. And I can, I can visually assess even across the room and say like, oh, 
Javier's having trouble with that one. Okay, because I can see from far away the sticks really easily. I can see if they're doing it or not. So kids are working sort of in their own space. They feel like they're working, um, they're working at it on their own, even though I am assessing them, even though they're sitting, you know, 20 feet away or whatever. So then it, it starts with me saying ta, 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 di, ta. And then I might play it on a recorder. I might, um, you know, play on the piano. I might give them a different example. I might clap it. And so that get, it has them, I mean, that's critical thinking because they're taking this idea that they already know, this process that they know how to do, and they're, they're, chain, they're using a different stimulus as they're recording. So instead of me saying what it is, they have to translate from the sound they're hearing into what they could put on the, on the board. That's actually pretty tricky for kids the first couple times. And so it's, it's a, an important process for them to do. And if you can articulate that to a principal, they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, the critical thing, their transfer of knowledge is so cool. Um, so anyway, what's fun is I, for the first several examples, just use ta, and, sorry, sorry eighth, note, eighth note pairs and quarter notes. And eventually a kid will be like, wait, Mr. Round, what if we have a rest? What, how will we make that with the sticks? Oh, I don't know. If we, if we have a rest, I'll guess we'll have to figure it out. And so then eventually I do give them a rest. And so kids are like, uh, because on, on the written notation, you know, it's, it's a Z with sort of a C on the bottom to actually make a quarter rest. And kids will sit there and will go like, hmm, how are you gonna, and that's another time not, it, it's so much fun to not just say like, do it like this. It's more fun to say like, hmm, how could you do it? How could you make it? And, and to put, to draw an actual rest up here and say like, huh, how could you make a rest that looks similar to that? without breaking one of my sticks because you can't, I mean, on the bottom of the rest, there's, you know, this little hook. And so how are you going to do that? Hmm, I don't know. And it's fun to see what kids come up with. And it's fun to give them the chance to do that, to explore, to try. Um, some kids, instead of showing them this, some kids will just do like an X, like don't make a sound there. I'm like, oh, you could do it that way. Um, some kids will do like a line horizontally, like no sound here. Oh, you could do it that way. And eventually I say like, well, if you wanted to make the actual like same symbol, if you wanted to make the rest shape, all you have to do is, you know, make this Z. Is it perfect? No. But do I, do I know, if I was going to read it, would I know that that's a rest? Yeah. Oh, completely. You could even make it not such a slanty Z. You could make it like just a Z Z and I would still know what it was. But giving the kids a chance to like do that is, is really valuable. And then I give them several more you know, auditory examples. I could give them, you know, playing on a hand drum. I could do whatever. I could even put up um, standard notation and say, can you turn that into your sticks? Can you, you know, project up the note neighbors on the board and then say, recreate that four beat pattern with your sticks. And it's just sort of cool that kids get to explore and create and come up with different things. They are dictating sounds because that's part of it. Um, you know, then I once they're done, I have to track along and read along what they've created to make sure that they got it right. So they're assessing what they've done. Um, they're tracking along with the music. As I say it again, as sort of a way to, to check their work. So really this whole process is super high critical things, super valuable when really it's just a bag with sticks and, and leaves. But what they're doing with it is, is super valuable. And again, if you have an administrator who's like, I gotta come watch you, like, do this lesson because it, it gives kids so many different chances to be correct and to explore and to try and usually they do really well with it and they love it. So it's, it's a great lesson to have people observe. Okay, I'm gonna skip third grade because I'm coming back to third grade to do um, a, a longer dive into that. Fourth grade um, is preparing for their fourth grade program coming up in December. Um, we're doing a show by John Jacobson and I think John Higgins, I think, um, called December Around the World, uh, or maybe Roger Emerson, I can't remember. It's a really fun show. Um, it's not like your typical like musical. I mean, it is um, sort of canned music with um, speech parts in between, but there's not really a through line storyline. It's more of, we're talking about different um, traditions from around the world. Um, in, in my time with kids, in my six years with kids, um, for performances, we'll do a folk song performance, we'll do a dancing performance, we'll do this sort of one that's sort of like a musical, we'll do more with instruments, but we do a lot of different things um, so that by the time they're done, we have done a sort of a musical, 
we have done something that's more of just an informants. We've done something more that's moving, maybe involving their family. Um, every grade is doing something a little bit different so that by the time they're done, their parents can look back on the concerts that their concerts that their students have done and see a spectrum of different activities. I used to think like, oh, I don't want to do a canned musical. Oh, oh, heaven forbid. And then I was like, but wait, there's so much value in that. Some kids like live for that. They love that. And some kids don't. And so then I'm like, oh, well, then I should do an instrument one for sure. But some kids live for that and some kids don't. So I, I like to have a spectrum through the six years they see me, they get something different. Anyway, fourth grade is the year that we do the, the musical. And so that's what we're doing this year. And it's a, a really fun one. So we're taking what we learned last time. We're adding in a little bit more and we're moving on to the next song. Um, the first song is really tricky actually because you have to speak it. You have to sing in English, German, Spanish, Swahili, and Japanese in the first song. So if I can make it through that opening song, everything else is a breeze. So we're, we're finishing up the first song and moving on to the next one. Uh, one of the tricks that I do to sort of make it a little bit more palatable and not take so long is um, each, well, two homerooms get um, a, like a feature song. So there's a song that like only two homerooms will perform, not all seven. So all seven will do the open, all seven will do the close. And then in the middle, you know, like Miss Hallman and Miss Jacobs homeroom do this song and Miss Cruz and Miss Baggerly's class do this song and whatever. So that then I'm not teaching seven songs to seven groups because that would take way too long um, and we wouldn't be as good at it. But instead I'm really, each class gets to learn basically three songs and then when we put it together, it looks super spectacular. And parents will actually like that, like their their students, like ooh, their class gets a special song that like they get to do just them, sort of. And so they like that, like their kid gets to move to the front and be a little bit more featured. So it, it saves a little bit of time. Um, fifth grade, we go through and we do we read the rhythms of the sixteenth um, and eighth note combination, which we learned about in the last lesson. Again, I see my kids once every seven days. So this is something I don't get to until fifth grade when maybe I would have gotten to it in fourth grade at another school. So we learn these, com we just learn these combinations. We go through and we, we reread them. Um, and then we go back to Tidio, which we did in the last lesson. And we add in um, ORF instruments um, for a quick ORF accompaniment. And then we play the game and do the thing. And some kids will play instruments, some kids will sing, some kids will do the game, and there's um, a little bit more variety. Whereas in the last lesson, we just basically played the game and sang. But now we're adding in instruments, which is a lot. <laughs> um, okay, let me jump into third grade, because um, that was the quick rundown of K through five. So let me just do uh, more of a deep dive into third grade. When they walk in, um, I, I always want like something that they're doing as we walk in. So as I'm standing at the door, I have my classroom microphone on and I say, turn my words into claps, ta, 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 dee, ta. So as they're finding their seating chart spot, ta, dee, ta, ta, dee, ta. And if I have to do something at the door, I gotta get a clipboard or gotta do, you know, whatever, I can do that as I'm speaking those basic rhythms and they're clapping as they're, they're finding their spot and sitting down. So what I, I did several weeks ago, and I shared about this was, um, and again, I'm sorry, this is backward, was I, I introduced to three, four, and five, third, fourth, and fifth grade, I introduced uh, dynamics, and I said, you know, okay, there, there are two main dynamics. Dynamic is just the volume, the loud and the soft of, or the loud and the quiet of what we do. And so, you know, there are two main ones, and there's this one, forte, and then there's this one, piano. And I actually showed them the full word, and we talked about how you might abbreviate it and use just the first letter, sort of like an initial for, you know, someone's name. You might just, just their first initial for that name, but you still know it means their name. And so we talk about that. And then I say, okay, turn my words into claps, but do it this loud. Ta di ta, ta di ta, and they clap loud. Okay, ta di ta di ta, ta, and they clap quiet. And so then um, this is fun to just flip around, which one am I gonna say? You know, like, or I'm, I might just say, don't clap, just repeat with your words, but do it this loud or do it this loud. And so the first time we, we do dynamics, it's only forte, it's only piano, um, and the, and we do a quick back and forth. It takes four minutes, five minutes, but then they get the concept of forte and piano, they're good. In the next lesson, I say, you know, those, those words that we had, there was forte, um, and then there was piano, and, but then there, you know, oh, sorry, I don't know if you can see that very well. There's forte, 
And piano forte means what? Forte means loud. loud, right? And then piano means what? It means quiet. Okay, well, and and one of the things that's really fun if you speak any Spanish, forte is basically a cognate of uh, fuerte, and fuerte in Spanish means strong. So Spanish speakers are like, ooh, forte and fuerte are basically the same thing. Yeah, they both mean strong or louder or you know with emphasis. So we get to talk about that. So then what we talk about in the second lesson, the second time they come back is um, I, we talk a little bit about prefix and suffix. And, and I say like in Italian, there's a, we go through that. And then I say in Italian, there's a special uh, suffix and it's this one. It's isimo. Anytime you add isimo to a word, it means very that word. And if you speak Italian and this is not true, please tell me. But it's um, it's sort of like ito in Spanish where it's like perro is dog, but perrito is small dog or puppy. Um, and so when you add ito onto a word, it means like the small version of that thing. Well, isimo, I tell the kids, means very that thing. So if I say, oh, you know, if I say, oh, I'm hungry, and you say, oh, yeah, I'm hungry, Sibo, it means you're very hungry. Or if I say, I'm happy, and you say, oh, yeah, I'm happy, Sibo, it means you're very happy. And so I say musicians wanted to use that, too. They didn't want just loud and quiet. They wanted another option. And so they knew piano meant quiet, and they thought, what if we add isimo, pianissimo, that would mean very quiet. And they, they added that in. And then same for forte, if they wanted very loud, Instead of just forte, they'd make it fortissimo. And so then we add in, you know, if you're going to use a symbol for that, and you mean like very quiet, it's almost like double quiet, like doubly, doubly quiet, you could do, uh, you know, two letters next to each other. So then it'd be pianissimo for, for double quiet. And same for double loud, you could just put the two letter Fs next to one another as fortissimo. And then... On the board, I have fortissimo, forte, piano, pianissimo, and I do again. Repeat after me, ta, 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 di, ta, and I'll point to one and they get to, to do it at that volume. They love being able to do a fortissimo, whatever. But again, it's just getting them to immediately apply that concept because we might not come back to it again for a little while, but, but it gives them a chance to apply that. When I first started teaching dynamics, I was like, piano, forte, I got it. Pianissimo, fortissimo, great. And then anytime I would try and explain mezzo forte, mezzo piano to kids, they, I lost them. My examples never worked. It was ne never made sense to them. And so I came up with this like ridiculous story that is absolutely not true, but it completely explains the concept to them. And I have not had to explain it again since. So <laughs> I'll just tell you the story. But um, again, this is not canon. This is... <laughs> This is not true, but for some reason this explains mezzo forte, mezzo piano to, to kids. So when they come in, I say, you know forte, you know piano, you know fortissimo, you know pianissimo. You know those words, they're, they're Italian words because when people first really developed music and we're talking about music and we're explaining music, they did it in Italy and the language of Italy is Italian. So that's why we use Italian words as our vocabulary because that, you know, when music was really developing, it sort of was centered in, in Italy. Anyway, I had a friend who went to Italy because he loved music and um, he saw all the cool things. He saw the Colosseum where the gladiators were and he saw this tower in a city called Pisa that's not straight up and down. It's leaning. It's called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And he saw all this beautiful art in the countryside and he had, you know, such a great time like swimming in the ocean or in the sea and um, it's so much fun. It was a great trip. But while he was there, he thought, you know it's from Italy? Pizza. Pizza's from Italy. I've got to have a real Italian pizza. So I went to this place called a pizzeria, which means a pizza restaurant. And warning, my very inaccurate and bad Italian accent is coming up. So just prepare. Um, so I say, so he went into an Italian restaurant and said, I'd like a pizza. And the person said, of course, a pizza. What size? He said, well, what size do you have? We have small or large. Okay, um, well, small would probably not be enough pizza, and large would probably be too much. Do you have a medium? No, no, we have we not have a medium. Okay, well, then I guess I'll have a large. Okay, a large pizza, great. And uh, what do you want to drink? And so he chooses something to drink. Okay, what size? Large or small? Hmm, large is probably too much, but small I'd be thirsty. Do, is there a medium? No, no medium. We don't have a medium. 
Okay, well, I guess I'll have a small. Okay, and your pizza. How hot do you want the pizza? You want it hot or cold? Hot or And the kids are like, hot or cold? I'm like, yeah, that's what he asked. said, you want it so hot that it burn your lips, or do you want it so cold to feel frozen? And they're like, um, is there like no in between those two temperatures? Like nowhere in the middle? No, no medium. We don't have a medium. Okay, well, I, um, I guess hot? I guess I can let it cool down. Okay, a large hot pizza with a small drink. And so, you know, he sat, the, my friend sat there and ate as much pizza as he could. <clears throat> he let it cool down. And then he, he said, you know, like, excuse me, sir, do you have a box? Why do you want the box? Well, because I, I've got leftovers. What are leftovers? Get <laughs> my Italian accent, so bad. Um, <laughs> what are leftovers? And he, well, I didn't, I didn't eat all the pizza. There's a little bit left. What do you mean you no eat a pizza? You you eat either eat all of the pizza or none of the pizza. No middle. And at this point, my friend's like, you know, I'm I'm noticing sort of a pattern. And so, and the kids are like laughing at me at this point. And I say, so the my next day, my friend went to go get a sandwich for lunch at a, a different restaurant. And he goes in and he says, I'd like a sandwich. Okay, yes, you want a sandwich. What size? Large or small? And the kids go, oh, no. I'm like, yeah. And he said, you know, is there no medium? No, we don't have a medium. And he said, well, maybe I'm not saying it right. Maybe maybe I just need to say it in Italian. And he asked the guy behind the counter, is, is there a word in Italian that means medium or in middle or something like that? And the person said, oh, yeah, yeah, we got a word. It's a mezzo. He says, mezzo. No, 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 not mezzo, mezzo. And I write it out for kids, and I write, um, I write mezzo on the board, and usually kids say mezzo. And then there's one girl who is really smart, and she said, oh, it's like pizza. And I'm like, yes, great. So then I write pizza next to it, because kids will not say pizza. They'll say pizza. But mezzo is the same idea. It's the same sound. Mezzo, pizza. And so I say, yeah, mezzo, like pizza. And so so anyway, so he learned mezzo is the word that means medium. He said, okay. And I said, so what a size of sandwich you want? You want a large or small? And he goes, can I have a mezzo? And he goes, no, we don't have mezzo by itself. Mezzo does not go by itself. Well, you have a mezzo, but not by itself. No, no, no. Mezzo goes with another word. It goes with a word. Oh. So my friend said, can I have, I don't want a full large. I don't, I can't eat a whole large. Can I have a mezzo large, like a medium large? Yeah, I can do that. A mezzo large, sure. Okay. How hot do you want the sandwich, hot or cold? Not all the way hot. Can I have mezzo hot? Yeah, 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 you can do mezzo hot, but not mezzo by itself. No, no, not mezzo by itself. But mezzo hot, not all the way hot, just like a medium hot. Yes. Okay, great. And what size of drink you want? You want a large or you want a small? Can I have not a full, not a small? Small's not enough. Can I have like a mezzo small, like a medium small? Yeah, I can do a mezzo small, sure. And so the kids are like, oh, we get like we're getting it now. And the man says, leans out from behind the counter, says, I got some music. You want to hear the music? You want it to be you want to be forte? You want to be piano? He says, well, Forte, I wouldn't be able to hear my friends talking with me. And piano would probably be too quiet. Can you do mezzo forte? He said, yeah, yeah, I can do a mezzo forte. And that means medium loud. Yeah, okay. And so then I write out mezzo forte. And then I underline the M and the F for each one. And then I abbreviate that. And I say, gosh, if you were going to say you wanted medium quiet, what do you think you'd say? And the kids all can say, like, oh, mezzo piano. And for some reason, that silly, ridiculous story of like not large or small, but medium, small, medium, larger. And I, I don't think mezzo actually works that way in Italian. I don't know. I don't speak Italian. But explaining it in that way and using that concept with kids of like two opposite things and, and not wanting just the polar opposites, wanting something in the middle makes sense. Years past when I tried to explain mezzo forte, mezzo piano, kids would always try and say mezzo on its own. They'd be like, oh, this one's mezzo. Well, no, no, like you can't just have mezzo by itself. Mezzo modifies another word. And so some kids are like, oh, it's sort of like a prefix. Yeah, sort of like isimo is a suffix sort of, but it, it gives this sort of silly story helps kids understand like, oh, it modifies the other words. And then I go to the board where all six of those options are fortissimo, forte, mezzo forte, mezzo piano, piano and pianissimo. And I say, here are now all the options. You, but, but the two most important 
are forte and piano. Because if you didn't have forte, could you have fortissimo? Well, no, because fortissimo is just forte with an issimo on the end, right? Could you have mezzo forte without forte? Well, no, because the mezzo just sort of modifies the forte. So it, it explaining it in that sort of silly way helps kids to see like, really there's forte and there's piano, and then there's a modification of each one. I could never get kids to do mezzo forte, mezzo piano until I use this ridiculous story. So if it works for you, great. If, if you wanna like modify it a little bit, tell me how you do it, that's a little different. But for some reason, I, I don't have to explain mezzo forte, mezzo piano after using that story. So that's my little trick. We'll see if it works for anyone else. And then after, after explaining it like this and after then showing it on the wall um, where you know, for, fortissimo to pianissimo are on the dynamics wall, um, kids get it and they sort of understand it. So in the next lesson, I um, show them a crescendo because I say, you know, on the wall last time we, we, we thought we had learned all the words, the dynamics words, but there are other words in that same category because they're pink, they're pink cards and all the pink cards are dynamics words. And so there's something else in the pink section and, and it's this thing crescendo and we talk about crescendo is moving from quiet to loud and it, it's it's what the the explanation I give is um, you know it's like it's getting bigger like the sound is getting bigger and we you know I demonstrate I show it and then I say you know there's a conductor and I pull out my baton I don't have one with me but I'm, a conductor keeps the beat and they can do it you know we try a couple ways we keep a normal beat we keep a fast beat we keep a slow beat and they say conductors show a crescendo and and I show like a small gesture getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and I demonstrate so I'll do like ta 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 and I show them how when the gesture gets bigger the sound gets bigger and we make the connection between the gesture getting bigger and the sound getting bigger to the the image of the crescendo getting bigger as it goes along in time in music and so that sort of helps kids see that progression. Now that they know the progression of pianissimo to fortissimo, they know what each of those words and, and um, values are along the way. Then we talk about the symbol that goes with the crescendo and then they see it, they physically see it. And then I have them say that, okay, you keep the steady beat and I'm gonna show you with my gesture how loud I want it to be by on crescendo by making my gesture bigger. I had never really brought in conducting into my lessons like this, but it just, it makes sense to show them the visual of the, the gesture getting bigger to, to mimic and to match the visual of the crescendo opening up. And so they get it and it's a quick and easy application. So in the lesson after that will come a day crescendo. Um, and I think that if I start with crescendo, then day crescendo makes sense. Like they'll get it going back to a small thing. So I, I hope, I hope that'll be a great next extension. But um, this is just like, it takes five, maybe 10 minutes at the beginning of the lesson to do this. And then I never have to, I don't have to have like one day lesson all on dynamics. I feel like if I add it in slowly over time, they get more repetition of it and they get a little bit more application of it. So just peppering it into each lesson instead of like week seven is an all dynamics lesson. I feel like they, maybe they get it a little bit more and understand we can apply it more if we do just a little bit every week. So that's what third grade starts with. They start with the dynamics really quick. Um, they We go through that process. Like I said, two weeks ago, two lessons ago, we did just forte piano. In the following lesson, we did forte piano, fortissimo, pianissimo. In the next lesson, we did mezzo, adding in mezzo forte, mezzo piano. In, in the, the following lesson comes crescendo. So it's just sort of a progression, but it starts with forte and piano because that's where it really goes back to. Um, in the last lesson, so the third grade's preparing for their folk dance, family folk dance night, um, which is coming up in November. And so uh, we've been doing a lot of different movement songs and games. We did um, a song called Old Brass Wagon. Um, we did the Grumpy March from the New England Dancing Masters. We did Sasha. Um, we did, um, in the last lesson, we did a song called Los Machetes, um, which is a, a 
thing I learned from Sana Longden years ago. And so in each in each song there are there are different concepts. So by the time we get to the family folk dance night, there'll be one at least one circle song, at least one long way set, um, at least one thing with some sort of instrument, um, a, a mixer. And so what I'm adding in, in this lesson is a song called Solomon Levi. I'd never done it before, and um, I've never tried teaching it before. So I'll just sort of tell you how I'm sort of teaching it now and <laughs> if it's working or not. Um, so Solomon Levi comes from the New England Dance Master, Sashay the Donut, um, and it's a square dance. And I have not, <laughs> I don't know if I feel comfortable teaching square dances, but we're making it work. So what the kids do is I pair them off and then um, we go through a couple dance moves that they already know that we've learned in other songs. Um, we do a swing your partner, we do a do -si do just like, oh, I wonder if you can remember how to do it. We do a promenade, which we've done in Old Brass Wagon. Those are all things that they've already learned that they're going to apply to this song, but they don't know that. But we, we go through them and just try them. And then we get into the square shape. Um, I would love anyone's ideas about how to get them into a square quickly. Um, maybe put a visual of a square on the ground, you know, use something else. I, I'm still struggling with um, so we get into the square shape and I say, turn to your partner. Great. And then we sort of look at the shape of what that would be. I put a visual up on the board of a square and like where your partner is. And I say, now turn and look at the person on your other side. And, and I show them the visual on the board of the square. And I say like, so here's your square. You're looking at your partner. If you cross that corner to see that next person, you find your neighbor on the other side. And guess what? We call that person your corner. <laughs> How cool, you're looking across the corner of the square to see them, and there your corner. So um, in this song, what it does and, um, is that the, the kids line up in this square shape, and then they do whatever the caller tells them to do. Um, and so the song goes like this. Honor to your partner, and bow to your corners all. All join hands and circle left, you circle round the hall. Now circle to the right, go the other way back, and then when you're home, you swing your own and promenade the hall, singing, Oh, Solomon Levi, la 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 la. Oh, Solomon Levi, la 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 la. So well, the, the cool part about it is they're taking concepts we learned, honestly, in Old Brass Wagon, and they're just applying them into the square shape. So the first part, honor to your partner. Okay, well, we've been doing that. Bow to your corner, so honor your corner, cool. All join hands on circle left. We've done that in another song, so they're just applying that. Then circle back the other way, cool. And then when you're home, you swing your own, so swing your partner, and then promenade. We've done all of that. It, it, takes, them, it takes them a little while in this first lesson to be like, oh yeah, yeah, we've, yeah, we've done that. But in a large circle. How to look here and usually in each square there's like the one kid who's like eh, everybody grab hands I know how to do this but it's it's fun because they're taking knowledge we've already done and they're applying it which means we're taking something we did in another song in a big circle song and just making it a square dance version of that so it's I'm not reinventing the wheel or the square in this case but we're taking that same thing and running with it so on the chorus they do a promenade but what's fun is since they're not really singing the verse, I'm singing the verse because I'm the caller, I can do whatever I want. So what's fun is then, like I can say, instead of honor to your partner and bow to your corners all, all join hands and circle left, you circle around the hall. I could do um, do si do your partner, or make sure that you don't hit, or make sure you don't collide, all join hands and, or right hand in and right hand star you star around your square i mean like i could if i want to be more strategic i could think about that but you could just write in whatever you want come up with whatever you want and actually in the notes from the new england dancing masters they say that um and they say we often don't practice the opening or the closing figures ahead of time and uh it says andy likes to say there are always things in a square dance that the caller forgot to tell you about you have no idea how the dance begins and so you know, don't attempt to think during this dance. Square dancing is 99% listening. There are no mistakes in square dancing. If you get confused, just go home and swing your partner until you hear something that makes sense. So it's fun to say, like, I might throw in something different, so just do your best to remember and to react, which I love. So um, I think I'm going to, for the performance, we're going to do the ones we've learned. But in this part of the, the learning, we might just do whatever, 
you know, comes up. Or if we need to remember right hand star, if we need to go back and do something else, we could throw that in. And this song allows for that. It also has a second verse where one pair circles around the whole square, and that's a little bit beyond my kiddos right now, but it, it's an option for you. So that comes from New England Dance Master Sashay the Donut. Um, I see I'm out of time, and so I've got to let y'all go. Um, so I thank you so much for coming along. If you have questions, there's that link page with all the links for things that I talked about tonight. Um, if you're in the Virginia Beach area, I'd love to see you at the Tidewater area or if chapter uh, this weekend. But um, if not, have a great week with your students. Thanks so much for spending your Monday night with me, everyone. Good night. By Facebook, thanks so much for coming along. I hope you uh, found some things beneficial. If you have questions, please leave those questions or you can um, check out the links page to see if I already linked those resources on that links page. All right, have a good night, everyone.